My name is Jo Grimmond. Um, I am have been an early childhood teacher for many years, over 25, um, but now my new role um, is with Early Start and um, I'm in the engagement team and we support um, centres across regional and remote New South Wales. So we have centres that are far as far south as um, Eden, as far north as Tweed Heads and as far west as Broken Hill and Wilcannia. And we support them um, in any way that we can. And, um, and part of that is delivering some um, quality professional learning. So um, I do do a little bit um, with educators because um, I am passionate about, I'm passionate about mathematics, but I'm also passionate about the home learning environment and working together with families. So um, I hope you enjoy this presentation tonight. Um, I'm also embarking on a PhD and my area of, um, of expertise, if you call it, is um, maths in the early years, particularly around patterning and symmetry and supertizing skills. So we're going to go through a little bit of, of that and what you can do at home with your, with your child or children um, in the home learning environment. So before we start, I'm just going to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which the University of Wollongong is situated, but also the lands across where we meet tonight. Um, we pay our respects to Aboriginal elders past and present who are the knowledge holders and teachers. We acknowledge their continued spiritual and cultural connection to country. And as we share knowledge, teaching and learning and research within this university, we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. I am a very proud descendant of Maria Locke of the Burra clan of the Darug people um, in the Sydney area. Um, so I invite you, if you do know your country, where you're coming from today, to type it in the, in the um, chat. My um, country, where I'm coming from, is um, a little tiny place on the south coast called Maria Heads, and um, we're on, on New England country. So today, what we're going to do today, we're going to consider the, the importance of mass learning in the early years for future success. Um, we're going to explore how to see maths in the home and in the environment and bring it to life in our everyday. We're going to explore how we can use play um, in particular and everyday items and objects in your home and surrounds to engage, engage in rich mathematical concepts of patterning and symmetry, measurement and number learning. And we're going to consider the language of maths and how we can use simple questions and mathematical terminology to extend the learning. So a lot to cover and I, I tend to talk a lot so I'm hoping that I, <laughs> I'm good with the timing but I might go over a little bit. Um, so we do ask, um, there will be time at the end of this to ask lots, lots of questions so if you have a question throughout just jot it down and um, I'll endeavour to uh, um, answer it as best I can at the end. No, can I, sorry Joe, can I interrupt? Yep. Also you can use the chat and put the questions in the chat and then I can I can uh, ask them on your behalf if you prefer it that way. A lot of people prefer it that way, but um, feel free to use audio as well, but feel free to, to type them in the chat. So the importance of maths learning in the early years, well, you are your child's first teacher. So um, I encourage you to use every opportunity that you can to engage in, in maths processes with your child in the home or your children in the home. Um, particularly during this time um, with COVID, um, we do have, for those of you who are at lockdown and you have uh, older siblings in the home, um, they need a break from remote learning through the day sometimes, don't they? So engaging them in play with the younger children is, is um, a fabulous idea as well. So before we get into the, the mathematical content areas, we really need to consider the importance of it. And um, well, there's a lot of research um, over many years that um, highlights the importance of maths learning um, and the, particularly the long-term effects of poor early mathematical ability on people's health and wellbeing. Um, and it's quite extraordinary really, and um, makes us really, um, you know, think about um, how important it is, particularly in these early years. Um, so as your first, child's first teacher and most important teacher, I will have, have to add, you can certainly play a very role, important role in this. In recent times, um, there's been a growing recognition of the importance of maths and STEM learning or STEAM learning, they're starting to call it now, including arts in, the, in, that, um, in that discussion, with research really demonstrating the relationship between 
proficiency of being good at maths in the early years and later maths achievement in school and, and beyond. And it highlights the critical importance of that learning um, in the early years as a very strong predictor of later maths achievement, particularly in the areas, I'm gonna talk about patterning soon, but in the areas of algebra, those higher level maths skills um, that we often don't think about in the early years, but um, we need to engage in lots of um, playful processes in maths um, in, in the early years. Um, I found this one quite interesting that mathematics knowledge is a better predictor of life success. There, so there's studies that have been done around that and they've found that, which I found quite fascinating um, because you would automatically think it would be the other way around, wouldn't you? But um, this is something to really consider as well. And poor early years maths knowledge is linked to greater likelihood of unemployment, poor pay prospects, homelessness, and health issues, particularly for females. So it's, it's something that we need to really consider um, when we're playing with our children. So having a mathematical mindset is really important in this because um, our own beliefs about maths and how confident we are um, with maths and playing with maths certainly impacts our children. Um, for many people, a dislike of maths can be linked to a lack of understanding of how maths is really embedded in everyday life. So um, I like to use the, the term having a maths lens, um, which enables us to see it in our everyday more and more when we open up our, our mind to it and we, and we wear a maths lens and we, we start to notice it in our environment and our everyday um, because we often think of, of maths and think of those, you know, structured cons, con, cons, rote learning and concepts, but um, it's more about the processes in the early years. So um, really need to consider that. Um, look, learning to recognise maths um, and processes of maths in daily life can help bring a new appreciation of mathematics and have a positive influence on our beliefs about our attitudes and our attitudes towards maths. Um, I often share a personal story of mine um, when I think about I was always quite confident with maths until I um, hit senior school um, with the HSC and I decided that I was going to do, I was ready to do tackle four unit maths. So I turned up to class. I was the only girl in the class. I had a male teacher and um, the rest of the class were boys and I just felt like I didn't belong. So um, I started to st having started to have actual fear and anxiety of going to class. Um, you know, when that double period of four unit mass came around, I'm going, oh no, I feel really anxious about it. I started to get, feel sick in the stomach even. Um, so that started to impact me in other areas of learning. So we need to really, um, really consider our, our own feelings and our own memories of mass and, and try and combat those and work through those because um, we need to change our mindset. Um, so sometimes, sometimes um, early childhood, talking about early childhood teachers and educators, they sometimes they experience fear and, and anxiety in relation to maths and, and they may avoid it completely. Um, it, it's much the same in the home learning environment um, where our attitudes, our feelings, our memories of maths sometimes um, impact on how we approach it in the, in the, in the home. Um, we know, we, we, that, so we tend to, to sort of um, drop back to, to just counting and looking at number with the children because we feel like we can do that. Um, but if we just focus on that, then children are missing, our children are missing out on so much more that maths is. Maths is complex, but it doesn't have to be difficult. Um, and because of the focus is on the processes and playing with maths um, in our environments, um, not that scary rote learning of maths that we have from high school. We need to see maths as fun. We need to see it as engaging. We need to see it as curious. We need to really learn how to tune into those possibilities to extend maths in, in play with our children. Um, and, and a common belief that you can see on the screen is just that sometimes people, we believe that we're just not good at it so and we'll never be good at it, as opposed to um, the fact that we can have a growth mindset. Um, and this looks at how, um, how the brain can grow, which we know by research, we know um, through research, very recent research of brain imagery, that the brain can grow from practice and challenge. So um, we certainly can change our mindset um, and that will help us when we're playing with maths with our children. So I really want you to consider that when we go through today. 
I could talk about that for, for the whole hour, <laughs> but I need to move on. So just a reminder, having a mathematical mindset means that we can see it everywhere. It's embedded in our everyday life. Um, we need to change that mindset. So we need to actually enjoy that learning about maths with our children. Um, and we need to think about it as exploration, discovery, inquiry-based learning, um, setting challenges and finding the answers with our children, um, engaging in mass discovery and keeping it fun. That's my big takeaway message from today because mass is certainly fun and um, certainly when we get to patterning and symmetry, um, you'll see that, that mass can certainly be, be fun. Block play, um, we need to, to think about block play and if you're lucky to have blocks in your, in your home, awesome <laughs> but think about if you don't think about other things that you can replace um, blocks like in construction like lego you can use recycled boxes and materials like that um, containers um, and you can see on the on the screen there with this little boy who's um, he's added um, other loose parts like see old cds and tin cans and engaging in rich um rich rich block play there. Um, I love these two quotes on the on the screen now. Blocks are a timeless toy. Um, they never stop challenging, stimulating, and engaging young children. A child's artistry in block building is closely related to the true mathematician's view of mathematics as a creative art. There's been lots and lots of research to support the idea that block play is closely related to mathematical understandings, and it truly is a vehicle to enhance mass learning um, through play with our children. Um, there was a study done um, by researchers at the University of Delaware and Temple University, where they, um, they looked at, um, they looked at um, a range of children and their family environments, and they found that, um, that for low income preschoolers who lag in spatial skills, such play, block play is very, very important for them. They looked at more than 100 three-year-old children of various socioeconomic backgrounds, and um, they, they found that children who were better at copying block structures were also better at early mass. Um, and when we think about, you know, Lego and following instructions of Lego or replicating um, photos um, from human made buildings and things like that, that's, the, that's what when children are practicing and engaging in those skills. Um, the study also found that by age three, children from those lower income families were already falling behind um, because this was a li likely as a result of more limited um, experience with blocks and other toys and materials that actually facilitate that development of those skills. So, um, it, you know, in short, blocks are really important resource to have um, and they're a really fantastic investment. Um, they also found that for those, for those parents, they, they were using more significantly fewer words like above and below because people, we don't realise that words like above, below, um, beside, behind, above, um, are actually, it's actually mathematical vocabulary. Um, so just by using those words in play with your child, you are facilitating that learning. Um, and you can do that with very, from infants, um, when they're not, you know, using language back to us, or they might be just starting language. They're, they're, they're like, we know that we're, they're like sponges. So they're picking up our, they're, they're learning language from us. So it's really important for us to embed some, some of that mass talk and math, mathematical language with them when we're playing with them. So again, if you don't have access to blocks, um, you know, use other construction materials like Lego, use other recycled materials to add to this construction, like you can see on the screen there. Um, think about some open-ended questioning, and we're going to talk about that very soon that you can use. Um, and there's also could be an opportunity for those older siblings to take a break from re remote learning and engage in the play as well um, if they're home. Um, and we know the importance from, from, um, from theorists like Vygotsky, we know the importance of more knowledgeable others and learning from more knowledgeable others. So um, <clears throat> what a great way to engage those older siblings in the play as well. So blocks are a major source of children's learning about shape and about spatial awareness. Um, we can discuss the different properties of shape. So, you know, um, the, you know, shapes that have the, the long sides and the short sides and the flat and the round and the cylinders and using that mathematical language as well. 
You could go on a shape hunt in your house or outside your house um, by finding shapes that um, it's actually called spatial orientation skills where we, um, we, we know that the shape of a window is a square or a rectangle. So that's, that's putting those spatial orientation and spatial visualization skills into practice. So doing lots of that with your children is learning about shape um, and learning about spatial reasoning skills. So um, do that. A fun fun um, activity to do is just make a little um, magnifying glass out of paddle pop sticks and, and make them into a shape and then go, go around and look through the shape of the, the square or the rectangle or, or this, find something to represent a circle, um, a paper roll or sellotape roll or something like that and um, find those different shapes in your house um, and outside your house as well. Um, you could also um, engage children in measurement, um, so comparing lengths of blocks and using smaller blocks. We're going to talk about me measurement more specifically very soon, but um, guessing, playing guessing games or predicting how tall the block tower is and measuring it with um, what, what I like to call informal measuring tools. Um, um, so finding something in, in the house to measure like paper rolls or pencils or crayons that we can then we that we can repeat along that length to, to test our um, to test to see whose block tower is the tallest or the widest. Um, when we think about number we're you know, engaging counting the blocks in their construction, counting in the measurements so counting how many of the smaller blocks, go alongside the block road that they've built or the Lego road that they've built or how many Lego pieces go along a, a length of block and engaging children in those um, informal, we call them emergent measurement skills. So really engaging them in that. And it's lots and lots of fun. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that soon. Talk, just touched on the comparing words. Um, so you can see these words that you would not necessarily think were mass, would you? But they are. So maths, um, we need to get, get our children to, to compare because in essence, that's, um, that's learning about measurement um, when we compare. So we need to, to really um, model this, this um, comparing maths vocabulary. Um, big, little, large, small, tall, short, fast, slow, heavy, light, hot, cold, um, young, old, loud, soft, high, low, near, far. Um, and lots of, um, lots of, using lots of um, mathematical vocabulary and describing words like that, every opportunity that we can, even with our infants. Open-ended questioning. So um, open-ended questioning is, the secret is that they don't, um, the questions don't put children on the spot to find the correct answer. So the children use the knowledge they have to think creatively and come up with a suggestion. So by just, looking at those phrases on the screen there, you can just put that phrase in front of a question to create an open-ended question. Um, and um, by saying, I wonder if, what could we do? Can we find a way? Tell me about what you've made. Tell me about why you've used those shapes in your block construction. So giving children an opportunity to describe is um, learning about maths. What did you notice about? Tell me about. So using lots of um, open-ended questioning, I'll make sure that this is um, in the handout that we provide to you, just to give, just to remind you that you can just add those little phrases in front of a question and it becomes this, and opens up um, your child to really use their creative thinking, um, critical thinking skills to, um, to predict. And, and often we don't know the answer to the questions either. So investigating the answers with your child is engaging them in mathematical processes. So, you know, when you're playing with blocks, for example, you could say things like, what would, you ha what would happen if, if, if you put that large rectangular block on top of this smaller square block? What do you think might happen? What did you notice about the way you use the blocks there? Tell me about your construction. Just by using those really simple open-ended questioning really promotes mathematical learning. Now, um, I'm hoping this, um, Matt, if you tell me that if this works, this video, and you can hear because I really want to show you 
I, I'm, I'm, I assume that you're aware of the Discovery at Home program through the Discovery Space, if you're a Discovery Space family. Um, but I, I want you to, to just draw your attention to this beautiful little video that Emily did last year um, when the Discovery Space was closed um, around maths, maths learning and see if you can pick out all the maths that's in this floating and sinking Lego activity by like building a boat. So hopefully it works. Matt, if you can tell me if you can hear it in a minute. Hi there, everybody. Welcome yep, to the working. Discovery Space. My name is Taryn, and you can probably tell I'm on our huge ship, our Antarctic research vessel. Now, today, we're going to be talking about boats. Now, there's not only one kind of boat. There's lots of different kinds. There are types of boats like this one here, little rowboats. They've got a point in the front, a square in the back, and they might paddle, people have to push it along to get it moving. So that's one type of boat. Do you know any others? Hmm, I've got a strange boat here. This boat is a sailboat. You can see it's got a big sail, it's so big, it would come all the way up here. So it moves by catching the wind to push it along in the water. And this boat is also special because it's got one, two, it's in the bottom there and a big hole in the middle to help it float and sail across rough waves. So today we are going to make a boat. That sounds pretty hard, doesn't it? But we can do it using all kinds of materials. So some of the things that boats have to do, hmm, the most important thing is they have to float. So we're going to do three things today to make our boats float. We're going to think, we're going to make and we're going to try it out. So we've had to think about boats, they need to float. Some of them might move by sails, some of them might move by rowing, some of them, like this one, might be really big and hold lots of people. This one here still has that point in the front and a big rectangle in the back. So today my boat I'm going to make is I'm going to make a boat from Lego. Now you can make a boat from Lego as well, or you can have a look around your house and see what other materials you have to make a boat. So I'm going to start really simple. I'm going to think. The first thing I want my boat to do is I want it to float. So I'm going to make something out of Lego that I think might float. So I'm going to clip my Lego together. Hmm, I think I might try and make one like our catamaran with two long pieces on the side and a bit of a hole underneath. Not that one, this one here. Mm. Get some long pieces of Lego for this. boat to start with to see if it floats. So let's have a look. I've got some water here and you could use a tub, you could use a bowl, you could use your bathtub, whatever you might like. And I've also set down a bit of a mat at the bottom just in case there's any spills. So you might want to add a towel at home. Now let's test out to see if this boat works. <gasps> okay, so my boat is floating. You can see if I move the water, the boat stays afloat. So I've had to think about my boat and I've made it, I've tried it out and it floats. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to think, how can I make this boat better? And I'm going to make some changes to make my boat even better. Mm, I'm going to try and make my boat taller. Um, so I'm going to add some big pieces in the middle. I wonder how this will go. like a sail for our sailboat. Hmm. So, I've done, made some changes. Let's try again. Oh, it still floats, but not very well this time. Hmm. I might have to think about that and make some more changes. This time, I'm going to try and make it bigger, but not taller. So I'm going to take this away and I might 
add some bits to the end. I'm going to put some bits here to make it longer. And across the back. And I might fill these in here to make our platform. Just like that. Now, those boats that we looked at before, they had a square at the back, but they had a bit of a point at the front. So I'm going to try that now as well. See if I can do a good point at the front. Um, so if I put this in here, that there, just like that. But it's not quite a point yet. I might need a few more pieces. That looks like a bit of a triangle at the front there. And let me just fill it in like that. Now, let's give this boat a try. Ah, oh, that boat floats as well. So we've made a big boat, I've made some changes, and now I've made a boat that I'm pretty happy with. I think that one works well and it floats around. I wonder where this boat might go. So now my challenge for you is, can you make your own boat at home? Could you make it out of Lego? And does it float? Maybe you'll have to make some changes like I did. It might not work every time, but that's okay. Because remember those three things we do. We think, we make, and we try. And then we go back. We think, make, and try again. So you could use Lego, you could use whatever you want. Send us the pictures of your boats floating at your house. And we get all of our boats together. So have fun building boats. See you next time. Bye. So there was lots of maths in there. There was science inquiry as well. So there was it was a real scientific discovery of whether um, building that boat, it could float, um, how well it could float. Um, she made changes and modifications. She used lots of mathematical language, long, longer, bigger um, points. So she, they, they, she talked about um, shape when she, she showed the, the pictures about uh, the different boats and the different shape of the boats. Um, so there was so there was area in it where she was filling up the space. So when we really open up our minds and, and use a math lens, you can really see how, um, how maths can be just embedded in play in with, um, yeah, in, in, and the vehicle of play really brings like maths to life. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about loose parts. So loose parts, when I talk about loose parts, I'm, I'm talking about things that you can find around the home, that you can find in the environment. So things like stones, sticks, flowers, leaves, um, pegs, marbles, um, buttons, anything that like that, that you can use to engage in lots of mathematical learning and mathematical processes with your child. So um, the, the one of the, the most fun things would be going on a, a, a loose loose box, a loose parts hunt for loose parts and then cut, gather them in a container. And just when, when you just be mindful that you'd want to have two of something so that you can engage in patterning and symmetry. And we're gonna talk about that in a moment, but um, certainly talking about um, sorting the loose parts, um, sorting them by color, by shape, by size, by, um, by function, um, depending on the age of your children and um, by weight, by length um, and size. You can see um, on the images on the screen where um, that little little um, fella has sorted and classified. So that's that's um, in the home learning environment, just small, medium and big. Okay, classification, that's actually an example of a graph and sorting data by just um, sorting and classifying the different stones. Down the bottom, you can see that little guy um, counting and engaging in counting processes. Um, but he's also sorted them, hasn't he, into colors. And, um, and that is a, a simple, um, simple way of graphing it as well and, and classifying data as well. So you can see masses everywhere and all around us, isn't it? And it can be certainly a lot of fun. So when we're thinking about making patterns, pattern, I, this is one of my favorite areas of mathematical um, learning. Um, and we need to do it more in the early years because it is a very strong predictor of later math success at school. So um, engaging in lots of pattern making. Um, and when I talk about pattern making, I'm talking here about repeating patterns. Um, it's fundamental to mathematics and it's essential for other, the development of other, it's foundational to other maths concepts. Um, but it's all, when we're thinking about repeating patterns, it's defined as a sequence of two or more items 
from our loose parts box that begin to repeat themselves. Um, so you can see that in the, in the um, image on the screen where that's an ABC pattern, um, because we often call patterns by their, their letter names, but um, yeah, get exploring different types of patterns. It involves looking for patterns, copying patterns, extending patterns, creating and describing patterns, um, and what we call abstracting patterns. So making the same type of pattern using different materials. So getting the children engaged in, in those type of experiences with your loose parts from your loose parts box um, is lots and lots of fun. Um, so creating patterns with materials, exploring the different types of patterns. You can see, um, so there's different types. There's AB, AB, which is a simple, just repeating one element pattern. Um, or two elements, I should say. Then you've got an ABBA. Um, so just exploring lots of different different patterns with your with your child or children. You can see um, it, items from the natural envi environment up the top. So flowers being used. So um, class classifying, sorting the different flowers by colour, but also creating a pattern with them um, with the little pine cones. Um, so going on a, a hunt for different materials in the environment as well, and using those. Um, the, the patterning. Um, I can't say it enough, engage your child and children in patterning skills um, because it's a really, it's foundational for learning maths um, and it's fun. So here's some examples on the screen there. So there's an example. So when you're creating patterns, getting your child to create patterns, um, you're talking about it. What comes next? Do you want them to extend? Um, so once they've made, once they've repeated those elements once, then get them to, to extend. What comes next? Um, oh, this comes next. Take, we're going to talk about missing pieces in the pattern in a moment, but um, you can see lots of examples. I just, the, the bottom image is actually from my research um, where um, I created a, um, a numeracy and block-based assessment tool and using blocks, so those beautiful blocks that you can see that I've got examples of here which are beautiful, made out of bamboo. Um, and I, I do, I have included in the handout where you can get these from because they are beautiful blocks. Really hardy, but they're made, made out of bamboo. Um, so sustainable as well um, product, but very, very high quality. So you can see him down the bottom. He's made an A, B, C, D, E pattern. And then he was, he came up with these really creative names for each element of the pattern. So he called them wombat holes, squares, um, door, window. <laughs> Uh, but he knew which one was the item in that pattern. So he repeated the same language. So he showed a really good understanding of patterning. Um, so have fun with it, find different materials, make lots of patterns um, and get, the, get your child or children to extend what comes next. Play guessing games. So create patterns, you create one, get your child to create one, take one, get him, him or her to take one away and see which see if you can, they can work out which one is missing from the pattern because this is another important element of understanding a greater understanding of patterning um, so what comes next what or what comes next what's missing from the pattern which block goes here which part of the pattern goes here i don't know what do you think um, and engage them in lots of fun games like that. And they love um, doing it for you. So take turns of, um, of playing with, um, playing those um, patterning games. So symmetry is another one of my all-time all passions. Um, symmetry learning is really underestimated um, that I found in my research. And it, again, it's a strong predictor of later mass success at, at school and beyond. And um, it's actually a predictor of later higher level things like calculus, trigonometry, probability, um, so high level mass as well. And when we think about formal learning about symmetry, children don't often learn about that do any more formal learning about symmetry until their second or third year of school. So we need to engage them more in the early years, don't we, with our children. And we can do that with, with construction as well. It, um, so there's two, two main types of symmetry that you can see on the screen. There's reflective symmetry, which we understand as you know um, mirrors when we think about mirrors and our reflections and um, and those early explorations of um, symmetry is often when an infant is um, is first noticed their reflection in a mirror in, in a mirror so they're engaging in that early pattern symmetry exploration as an infant 
Um, so we can certainly um, explore that with our children. Then we have rotational symmetry. And before my research, I had no idea what rotational symmetry was, but in essence is actually um, a repeating pattern that it repeats around a central point. So when you think about mosaics, when you think about mandalas, um, windmills, propellers, um, mag wheels even, um, that's, they're really good examples of radial and rotational symmetry. And that's actually strong, strongly related to patterning as well. So they go hand in hand. So engaging um, your children in lots of explorations of, of reflection and, um, and rotational symmetry. And it's fun using loose parts to create um, patterns is really lots and lots of fun. And you'll see that, you'll see this in examples in a minute. So when we're looking at reflective symmetrical pattern, we can use at home, you can use a piece of string, a tape measure, a drawn piece of chalk on the ground, or a line on a big piece of paper. And just with your loose parts that you've collected, you can see shells on the screen here as examples, but explore reflect, reflective symmetry and create reflections. Um, with your child or children um, and draw their attention to, um, because often children, when they're first um, exploring symmetry, they'll put um, the shells, you know, like uh, using the example on the screen, the shells the same way rather than reflecting them. So use the words, oh, let's turn it around. Use the word symmetry. This side reflects the, this side. This side is the same as this side. This side reflects this side. So don't be afraid to use those big mathematical terms with your children um, because, you, yeah, you need to, um, even with young children. So using that, that language is really important. Um, and explore it. Go, you know, if you're close to the beach and you're not, you know, you can get out with your exercise in lockdown, go, go for a hunt for shells and, and driftwood and create reflections um, with those. The children just absolutely love this activity and it's a really fan, fun way to engage in um, learning about symmetry. So you can do that and you can do that with drawing as well. So drawing a line down the middle and and you do one side and they do the other, or they do one side, you do the other and take turns and with that beautiful, we call it dyadic engagement. Um, so have fun with it. Exploring symmetry in nature. Well, um, if you're lucky enough to have little mirrors at home, um, you can certainly engage um, in exploration with mirrors um, and, um, and fate, like just explore it if, with young children with facial expressions and getting drawing their attention to the reflection in a mirror. Um, you can see an example of graphing up the top there where they've looked for symmetry and they've gone on a symmetry hunt in nature and they've found examples of symmetry because it's all around us. Um, and when we open up our mind to it and we use that mass lens, we can find it everywhere. Printmaking, um, so using leaves to print and creating rotational symmetrical patterns um, by printing it. So here's just some examples of what you can do with the natural environment. Here's other examples of using loose parts. These are taken directly from the early University of Wollongong Learning Labs program. So I worked with seven and eight year old um, students in the holiday program and we did um, symmetry. We did lots around symmetry and um, it was called Engaging Young Engineers, but I embedded a lot of maths in it and they just had lots of fun. So I provided lots of different loose parts. You can see sticky tape, sellotape being used there. Um, Play-Doh, little plastic cups, um, think about using things that you can recycle in your home, um, straws, um, paddle pop sticks, um, different co like coins even, um, buttons, pegs, and um, there's some examples of um, rotational symmetry and reflective symmetry on the screen there. Also getting your child to represent their learning is another way that cements it, cements the learning. So when they're um, building with blocks or Lego, Encourage them to get clipboards even, if you can get some clipboards from Officeworks or, um, or, or, or they love using clipboards. So clip, that's why I say clipboards are a really good idea um, to document, but um, to use paper, whatever you've got and get them to represent it by drawing it. So it really does, um, does facilitate and cement the learning. And it's not to mention the fact that it's fun. So here you can see I gave them what's called a design challenge. So the design challenge was to create, to work with a partner and create a rotational symmetrical pattern with the, with, um, the loose parts. So you can see um, he's just finished his and he's drawing it now. Um, and um, you can see examples down the bottom where they're using blocks and um, 
plastic cups. You can see these beautiful blocks. They're really, they're really beautiful, aren't they? So um, yeah, that's they're they're an investment, I would say, um, but they're lifelong. You can use them um, forever. Here you can see technology. You know, we know that our children are really drawn to net technology these days, um, but if we can engage in um, some learning around it um, by using technology as a tool for research. So researching different examples of symmetry in human made forms, but also nature. So down the bottom, you can see me teaching with my long hair um, and using the smart board to um, explore symmetry in man -made, human made forms and also in, in the natural environment as well. So it's, you know, you can do that on your, on your phone or your or their iPad. Um, it's just another way of engaging in, in, um, in, in, in a functional way of using technology. Mapping, one of my favorite things to do too with children, with young children um, is mapping. So mapping is essentially a representation of a space and its characteristics um, and how the, that the objects within that space relate to each other and it's mathematical learning and it's fun um, creating maps and making decisions about what features to include with the loose parts so you can get your child or children to map different parts of their like they could map their bedroom they could use their loose parts to create a map of their bedroom they could create a map of your yard they could create a map of your living area by using loose parts. So um, children just love it. Um, they, they really do. Here on the screen, you can see examples of the discovery space. So when I was working with the early year students um, in the numeracy subject, I got them to do this activity with loose parts so they could use whatever they want. And they their, their design challenge was to create a map of the discovery space from memory. And um, one group decided to draw it, another group you can see it's three-dimensional um, using paddle pop sticks to, I can see the, um, the stairs with the cave underneath. I can see um, oh, one, one example that I can't quite see because I'm looking at everybody. Oh, I can see um, different things that represent you can really you can really see it, can't you? If you've been in the discovery space, but um, it's really important learning. It's important um, spatial learning um, about space, and um, it's important for children to represent and those spatial relationships between items on the map. Um, I always talk about myself in this um, area of maths because I, I believe that I was um, I didn't engage in much learning about spatial reasoning skills or mapping or anything when I was young because I cannot navigate my way around a building and I cannot navigate my way around a ski hill. So I joke about that all the time in my workshops, but it's in essence, it's correct. I wasn't I was from a lower socioeconomic family. I didn't have blocks in the house. I didn't have um, Lego. So those materials are really good tools to learn spatial reasoning skills and map. Um, so I really have to work hard on those skills now. Um, but it's really important for us to engage. Plus it's lots of fun. You can use recycled uh, materials to do that as well. So boxes and um, create cities or it doesn't have to be something in your house. It can be a city or a, a park, their favorite playground. See if you can get them to represent that. It's all learning about maths. So number, I always leave number to the end because number, although we haven't talked about measurement yet, but number, um, it's, it, it's important. It allows us to quantify our world, but we often just think of maths as number and it's as hopefully I've opened up your eyes to seeing maths as so, as so much more. And I, I could talk all night about different areas of maths as well. Um, but certainly we need to do engage children um, with number learning um, and um, it's, it aligns well with measurement as well. And you can see, you can just make simple resources in the home with cardboard boxes. So you can see this little toddler is matching matching numbers, but you could have, we're gonna talk about subitizing in a minute and what that term means, um, but you can have the dots to represent the number for older children and they have to park the cars where the dots are and play lots of games like that. So I've got to share lots of other, other ideas. Pointing at number in the environment. So when you're going for a walk, um, you're pointing out the numbers on the letterboxes, you're pointing out numbers in the grocery shop um, and, and things like that. So pointing out um, numbers as symbols in the environment um, helps to cement the learning as well. Other examples that you can do with loose parts. So I'm all about loose parts tonight, but 
using their loose parts to represent the number. So there you can see pine cones being used. Down the bottom is a really simple activity that you don't have to have those pom-poms, you can use um, coins or buttons or marbles even. And, and just that's just a, a little supertizing game that, um, that helps with supertizing skills. So, which is another really strong predictor of mass, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Um, you can see up the top, you don't have to have the wooden numbers or numerals. You can just get your child to make them, create the number cards to go with the, the loose parts. Um, I'm a big believer in getting the child to do as much and make, create and make marks um, and uh, um, accept those approximations of the, the numerals of, as well. But there's just some activities. Now, counting quantities. Um, counting, we know, is essential for number learning, um, for developing competence in math skills. And they work through five, what's called five principles of counting. So we know one-to-one -one where they match the counting word to the, to the, to the item. The stable order is, the, is when counting, the, realizing that the counting sequence stays the same. Cardinal principle means that the last counting word that you get to is actually the total of the objects or items. Um, the order of relevance principle talks about um, when counting, it doesn't matter which objects that you start with, it's the total remains the same. And the abstraction principle is that the number of objects in the set is the same regardless of whether they're, if they're, if they're all, if you're counting all animals, it doesn't matter if some are dogs, some are cats, some are cows, some are sheep. If you're counting animals, then it doesn't matter if they're different. Um, I'm just wary of the time. There's a, this little video that quickly goes through. There are five counting principles, three of which are absolutely essential. The first two go hand in hand. The first is stable order. That means that students need to know their number names in order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. You tie stable order with one-to-one -one correspondence, which means you give each object one count and only one count, like this, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now the third counting principle is cardinality, which indicates how many are in this set. When I counted this set, one, two, three, four, five, six, the last number I said was six, which indicates that there are six objects in this set. Now the other two county principles are not essential, but efficient counters demonstrate these principles. The first is abstraction. Abstraction means that you can count any set of objects. So for example, I could take out some of these motors, bring in some clips and a bear. And if I say that all of these are in the same set, I can count this as a set. For example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight objects in this set. It does not matter that they're not all the same shape, color, or size. And then the fifth counting principle is order irrelevance. I can count objects from left to right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I can count objects from right to left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I can really count objects in any order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight objects in this set. So I just wanted to play that because it really does highlight those different um, counting principles. But um, learning to count involves all of those things, um, which we, we didn't realize before. Um, so what can we do to promote pet? Um, counting in the home well you can make numerals prominent so get your like I talked about get your child to create number cards that they can use with different with the loose parts or in different ways in the home um, you can um, you know point out colors throughout the house cards with dots and numerals on them um, to go with um, supertizing skills so I'm going to talk about that in a moment you can um, use written numerals and encourage children to write or make marks. So play shops or um, make lists of things, get your child, use those clipboards and make lists, shopping lists um, or other lists, um, lists, make a list of what they need out of the pantry and engage them in, in that. Make a list of what ingredients they need to cook. So when you're cooking something in the house, get the child to actually make the list of the 
um, approximate the list. So you're engaging um, children in that, in, in that, um, in writing numerals as well, pointing out numerals in the environment, like I talked about, tapping into everyday activities. So counting things at pack away time. Um, so turning pack away time into a fun acti maths activity. So you can sort during pack away time as well. So um, set your child a challenge. Oh, let's just pack away the um, and classify. So oh, let's just pack away to start with. We're just gonna pack away all the cars. Let's pack away all the cars and then count them and engage them in maths play and turn it into a fun game because we know pack away time is, is a bit of a chore um, with young children. So turn it into a fun game. Um, count things at lunch and snack time. Count loose parts that we find in the in indoors and outdoors. So you engage King counting with, with your loose parts box that you've collected. Um, engage in board games. I can't see that say this enough. We've forgotten about board games in this technology driven world. Um, and we need to engage in board games because there's rich maths learning, particularly around supervising, you know, using a dice um, and turn taking. Um, so really important to engage in, um, in board games um, with young children and read and discuss um, literature um, that, and particularly ones that involve solving a problem. Um, and there's lots of quality stories um, and I've, I've actually um, included a list of, of quality stories that in, in Engage, that children can engage in mass um, learning with in your um, handout. So I talked about supertizing and you might be thinking, what is supertizing? Well, supertizing is actually the Latin word for suddenly. And it means to recognize a number immediately without counting it. So, and we, we often think about supertizing when we think about a dice and we think about dominoes. Um, we, you know, children need to be, it's a very strong predictor of later math success. It's foundational for math learning. So we need to engage children in lots of learning, um, in games that involve supertizing. You saw the example of the lock and the key, where they have to find the key that goes with the lock that has the dots on. That's a great activity that you can make in the home. Um, so think about um, how you can engage in that by playing, uh, playing board games is a good start because they, they're all engaging in supertizing, learning about those, um, the, the array of those dots on the dice. Um, they're learning that that three means three. Um, so, um, and, and it's early, those early engagements in supertizing skills for, forms a foundation for addition and subtraction. Um, so often when they're able to supertize and see two, um, they can see two and two and they, they learn that, that that is four, that's a representation of four um, or three and two. I've seen preschool children do that. So um, lots of engagement in supertizing is really, really important. Um, and as I said, it's a core component upon which all mathematical abilities are built um, in the literature. It's very outlined quite clearly. You can see an example of, of a game, a bingo game that you can get your, um, make with your child. Get your child to draw the outline rather than just have some template that you've made. Get, the, get your child, if they're old enough, to draw um, their favourite thing, a car even, and divide it up into, into um, components and then, um, and then do that. And you can, use, again, you don't have to have the pom-poms. You can find things in, in the home. Stones um, you can use for this. And it's just a simple bingo game. You could play it with a dice as well. So they're getting that the double um, cementing of the learning. Um, so yeah, I can't say it enough. Engage um, children in lots of, um, lots of this. This is one of my favorite things to do. It's part of my assessment tool that I've created, but it's a supertizing guessing game. So you can do this. You don't have to have those blocks. You can do it with, again, buttons, stones, anything that you've got on at in the house um, and you can lose, use those loose parts. And what you do is you cover, you make that array and you can use the dice as um, a representation. So make the three dots with materials like you can see on the screen, cover it up with something. So cover it up, make it underneath. I, I usually use a bit of cardboard as just a screen. So you can use whatever you've got at home and then get your child to close their eyes. So close your eyes, make it and then open it. And then, then you say, one, two, three, look and see. And they have to, and then you close it again. So they have to automatically um, say what that number is. And then you can use the number cards that they've created um, for them to represent it as well. It's further um, cementing of the learning. So um, it's a great fun game and it's learning about supertizing. It doesn't matter if they're right or they're wrong. It's just engaging, oh, let's count. And then you can get them to count and check. Um, their answers, but just get, and, and they love doing it to you. They love being the, the teacher 
um, and actually creating those arrays and making you guess as well. So engage lots of, you know, lots of turn taking. So it's one of my favorite things to do. So um, I do recommend that you um, do lots of, lots of games like this. This is a really simple one. So you can have a template of the dice if you don't have a dice at home, but just roll the dice game. So you can create a tally, um, a graph, and they just tally. And tallying is data. It's organizing data, it's number learning, it's maths. Um, you can see this little Vivian on the left-hand side needs the representation of the, the dice um, to know that that's two or one. The Finian, he doesn't need it. He just knows that, that the, those dots are one or those dots are two um, and they just tally it. And you can see the approximations of the numbers as well. So yeah, I engage in lots of things. So bringing number sense to life in the home, make numbers prominent, like I talked about, explore numbers in stories, make numbers a part of your everyday. Um, so calendars, counting, representing, embedded in, in, into other, other learning. Um, like measurement that we're going to talk about right now and I'm nearly out of time but I'll keep going and stay with me um, but I'm nearly finished so um, I don't want to cut cut it short because there's um, I, I really want to talk about measuring with you but um, you can see comparing the little boy on the screen there is um, is counting and measuring how long it is um, and documenting it um, so you can certainly use lots of loose parts to do that. You can see her measuring her arm by cam, um, and that's part of, that's number learning as well as measurement um, because they, they go hand in has, hand as well. Represent data in graphs. So I love graphing with young children. So, um, you know, if you've got birds, what a great activity. Let's, let's see if you've got a lot of magpies, which is coming into magpie season. We have a lot of carawongs where I am at the moment. So. Um, tally up how many carols come to visit or how many birds you can see or how many cars you can see go past, how many red cars um, and graph it, a great activity to do. Um, thinking about doing something like that while we're in, while we're in lockdown is, um, is a really good playful way um, to engage in number learning. Here you go. Here's some graphs on the screen now. So different ideas, how many magpies you can see the approximations of, um, of the different numbers and on the different days. So you can easily make these as graphs. Um, the magnets, if you've got a magnet, that's scientific learning. So this little boy used a clipboard, just a, a, a magnet representation. He went around and tried to find in his house what was magnetic and, and he represented it by drawing it. Um, floating and sinking is a great activity to do and making predictions of what out of your loose parts, oh, I wonder what might float and what might sink. Predict it, predict might, get your child to predict what they think. You do it as well, oh, I don't know. Um, document it and then test your predictions after. And that is essentially mass. Because <coughs> um, mass is, is um, organization of data as well. So lots of science learning here too, isn't it? And lots of fun, creating a ramp down the bottom there and predicting whether, you know, what all these different shapes, whether they roll. Um, you can use cars, which one might go fast or um, which is going to be the fastest and make predictions about that. So um, graphing with young children is really important, maths, maths learning as well. And it's fun. It's fun to do. Measuring is all about um, finding how, how long or how high something is. Area is how much space is covered. When we're thinking about mass, weight and mass, it's how heavy it is. Volume and capacity, how much something holds. Time, events take more or less time than each other. So we can engage um, with our children in these, these are called measurable attributes, in these measuring processes with our loose parts. So, um, this is just a little short little clip of exploring the volume and capacity of the guards. Predicting getting a child to bring how many cups of water can you put in the guard? How many cups do you how many Park um, videos which are just freely accessible so I've, I've um, you'll get a link to it and there's lots of different 
um, little playful um, snippets that you can use to get ideas of, of what you can do in the home learning environment as well. I love that one because it's measuring. You could also do this it doesn't have to be water, it can be marbles. How many marbles do you think it will take to fill this? How many golf balls or whatever you've got? How many of these stones um, will take to fill up this um, jar? Which one do you think will hold the most? So engaging in those processes. Oops. And using units of measurement, I'm nearly finished, so stay with me. Um, so we talk about when we're talking about emergent measuring and learning about measurement, we talk about um, informal units of measurements and formal units of measurement. So formal is things like rules and tape measures um, that you think are measurement. And informal units, which I think in the, in, um, the early years is so important to build learning um, for and getting children ready for those more formal um, units of measurement but using things that you've got in the home as measuring tools. How many forks do you think might take to measure the length of me? Or um, if you've got enough forks, um, measure each other, measure each other with blocks, measure things with um, Lego, measure things, whether you measure toys. Um, so you just use the same material in the measuring process. So the same pencils, um, or, or paper clips to measure a pencil or whatever you've got in, in your house blocks. So it's using um, a unit that you can repeat and they engage in counting and number learning as well. And, um, and it's, again, it's fun. It's, it's, it's actually a lot more fun than using a tape measure and a ruler. You, you can use string as well. I've seen string being used very effectively as a measuring tool. So um, working out what's the middle of something by using a piece of string. Um, so children need to be engaged in these measurement processes, learning about how um, to measure. And, um, and it's, again, it's fun. Paddle pop sticks and matchsticks are another really good resource to use as a measuring, informal measuring tool. Paper rolls, um, toilet rolls, or anything that you've got in the house, containers, anything that you've got in your house that can repeat. Cups, if you're measuring volume and capacity. Um, engage your children in cooking, lots of cooking um, experiences and engage them in the measuring of the ingredients. Um, and instead of using the formal units, try using a, you know, something that you can repeat like teaspoons. Let's see how many teaspoons of um, flour it takes to fill up this cup or get your child to predict it, record it and then test your prediction. So engaging in that scientific inquiry as well. Um, so really important for them to learn um, about those processes of maths rather than just using, you know, an info a formal measurement like scales or, um, or um, rulers. So engaging young children in those processes will set them up for, for really foundational learning with formal units of measurement. And just lastly, oh, I've just gone over, but I'm just about finished. Exploring maths through literacy. So lots of stories have got lots of fantastic embedded maths in them. And The Very Hungry Caterpillar, um, big shout out to Eric Carl, who we lost um, this year. So um, that was a big loss, but The Very Hungry Caterpillar, if you don't own this story, you need to do yourself a favor and get it um, because there's lots of rich learning of maths. And here it is on the screen there, who would have thought? So when thinking about the story, they count the number of things the caterpillar likes to eat. They link, it's linked to a sequence of numbers related to the days of the week. So he ate, you know, one on this day, Monday and Tuesday, he ate two pairs and so on. They, they're learning about ordinal number. So what comes first, second and third and lots of stories do that. So think about stories that have what, what happens first, what happens second, what happens third in the story. They're learning about time and events when they're doing that, counting on, so adding one piece of fruit each day, comparing sizes of fruit, comparing the growth of the caterpillar as the caterpillar starts to grow inside the cocoon, classifying foods is mass learning, time reflecting on what time day the day children eat and what time they have lunch and dinner and day and night and length of time. And um, so engaging children in that, in your day, we have breakfast, then we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do this, then we're gonna have lunch, then we're gonna do this in the afternoon. Get them to represent and draw a picture of what's gonna happen in their day. 
that's um, cementing the learning. Space, egg on a leaf, cocoon around himself. So that's maths language and learning hatched inside the leaf, egg. Symmetry, when, they're, when you're looking at the leaves and the butterfly. And chance and data, collecting the, the data of the favourite food and record the findings and talking to your child about what their favourite food is and, and creating a graph of that, of each in the family. What are, what are each of our favourite foods? What's our favourite vegetable to eat? What's our, what's our favourite um, dessert that we have? And making create a, creating a graph out of that is, is engaging in mass learning. And that's the end. Um, so um, big takeaway, have fun. Have fun with mass and play with it and engage um, with your child in those processes. And don't think that you've got to have all the answers all the time either because it's the learning happens when they're engaging in those processes and investigation.